Mrs. Radley, you have pleaded guilty to murdering your husband. He was a brute, unfaithful. I was left alone all day. <laughs> uh, my, my lord, I, I must speak up. What is it? I must object to myself as a juror. I am personally acquainted with the accused. Very acquainted. It is proper at this point to remind the jury that if you have any acquaintance with or knowledge of the accused, you may not try this case. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, darling. <laughs> Is a disgrace. Oh, it's yourself, Minister. Aye, it is indeed, Mistress McGregor. Do I hear music? Yes, you do, Minister. Mistress McGregor, may I remind you that this is the Sabbath, and the good Lord disapproves of singing and dancing on the Sabbath. Oh, but we're not dancing. We're having an orgy. <laughs> well, we're playing games. What sort of games? Well, in this one, the men folk take all their clothes off and stand in a long line. Merciful heavens. <laughs> the women are blindfolded, and they have to identify the men by touch. <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. Oh, come away in. You'll enjoy yourself. As a matter of fact, your name has come up twice already. <laughs> Fred? 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 Uh, vodka and bitter lemon. Fred! <laughs> the noise downstairs. Oh, Ethel. Shh. I can't hear anything. Shh. You're imagining it. Oh, it's stopped now. Good. <laughs> it sounded like someone trying to get in the front door. Uh, yes? Remember that weekend we spent at Brighton? Yes. And you woke me up in the middle of the night and said, Fred, there's somebody moving downstairs? Yes. And we were staying in a bungalow. <laughs> that was different. Good night. There is someone in the garden. They're prowling around the house. Oh, good, Alphys. Oh, Fred, they're coming up the drain pipe. It must be a cat burglar. Who'd want to pinch a cat? <laughs> oh, I'm frightened. Oh, so am I. It's your husband. <laughs> It's lovely to be back with you for another Sunday day, especially at this season of goodwill. You'd hardly credit the number of Christmas cards viewers have sent me from different spots all over Britain. Rodney Nugent says if I mention his mother on the programme, it'll make her very happy. As good a reason as any, Rodney, especially as your mum is admired by everyone for the tremendous courage she has shown in her lifelong struggle to overcome bad breath. <laughs> Sorry I can't pop round to see you, Mrs Nugent but keep smiling. 
preferably with your mouth closed. <laughs> you know, illness, big or small, has its part to play in life's scheme of things. Wouldn't life be awful if we couldn't have a bit of an illness now and again to break the monotony? <laughs> Certainly, my weekly post bag would be a sad and empty one if it weren't for all your lovely infirmities and afflictions. <laughs> so all you devout but decrepit folk do keep right. <laughs> Toes of a front corn is living proof of what the human body can stand. And yet she dropped me such an amusing note about her latest operation. It's her third operation since Easter. It's good to know you've kept your sense of humour, Winnie. If indeed, not much else. <laughs> Mrs. Arkwright has told me all about her hubby's gallstones. Elsie Allnut has written to me on her sister's shingles. And Henry Kirby has written to me on his mother's leg. Thanks, Henry, but if you don't mind, postcards only. <laughs> and a very big thank you to Sissy Warren for this delightful postcard from Lourdes. Sorry to hear the trip wasn't a complete success, but we must expect miracles, must we? <laughs> By the way, Sissy Love, I'd have a bit of a problem reading your handwriting. At first, I thought you said you found Lourdes a bit grotty, but then I put me other specs on. Lourdes has got a big grotto. Well, that's more likely, <laughs> isn't it? A grotto, in case you don't already know, is a sort of sacred hole in the ground where a lot of folk get cured of things. You don't even yawn in case your mouth heals over. <laughs> you had a nice newsy letter from the Wagstaff family in Rotherham. You write to say your daughter Bernice came home from Spain with a case of typhoid. My word, a whole case full. That'll make some lovely cuppers, won't it? <laughs> Since the series started, we've played all your favourite hymns from Songs of Praise. A lot of you must have got the Christmas spirit because I've had a great pile of letters asking me to choose my own favourite hymn. So here's the most beautiful hymn I know. Every minute of the day you got your head stuck in that picture book. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Emily. But the lady in the story is so wonderful and so clever, and she does such exciting things. I wish I could be just like her. Oh, and who might this lady be? Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Great Britain? Why, Dorothy, I wouldn't trust that woman further than our picket fence. <laughs> oh, you're wrong, Auntie M. She's marvelous. I wish she'd visit Kansas. I wish I could get to meet her. Drink cover, folks! There's a big twister heading this way! <laughs> Looks like you're gonna get your wish, child. <laughs> a twister is a, a whirlwind full of hot air. It flattens everything in its path. That's her! <laughs> the storm, sir. No, I want to go take a look. Dorothy, you come back here this minute. No. I've got a feeling I'm not in Kansas anymore. Where am I? <laughs> Welcome to Munchkin Land. Who in the world are you? We are the Munchkins. <laughs> you sure are little, aren't you? We didn't start out being little. We used to be tall like you. Then the Wicked Witch cast a spell and made us small. Well, I guess no one enjoys being made smaller, but like Mrs. Thatcher says, cuts have got to be made if we're going to bring down inflation. <laughs> Did you have a cut in your private sector? 
Don't get personal. <laughs> I didn't mean to be rude. I'll bet if Mrs. Thatcher was here, she'd know how to deal with that wicked old witch. She's so brave, she never changes her mind, she never makes jokes, and she never apologizes because she's never, ever wrong. She's, oh, what's the word? Insufferable? <laughs> Where does she live? In Great Britain. She practically runs Britain single-handed. I figure if ever the Queen should get tired of posing for postage stamps, that Mrs. Thatcher will take over and rule the country. <laughs> oh, only I can meet her. Maybe the Wizard of Oz could introduce you to her. He's all-powerful. He knows everybody. He lives in the Emerald City. You just follow the yellow brick road and keep straight ahead. And now you turn. All right, you catch on fast, don't you? Pardon me, you're Dorothy, aren't you? Oh, my goodness, a, a talking scarecrow. I thought Michael Foote had retired. <laughs> what are you doing up there? I have no choice. Life gets tedious standing here day after day with a pole up my back. Scaring crows ain't much, but... That's all I'm fit for. You ought to be ashamed. What about all the youth training schemes? Where's your ambition? <laughs> Supposing Mrs. Thatcher had felt that way, why, she'd still be helping a paw run the grocery store back in Grantham. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher, the Prime Minister? Nothing ever phases her. One day she's having her hair done, the next day she's sinking the Belgrano. She'll do anything, no matter how awful it is for her. Taking on the miners, talking to Jimmy Young, anything. You've got to admire the way she fights for her sex. If she didn't fight for it, she probably wouldn't get anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm a failure. I'm made of straw. I haven't got a brain. I can't string two words together. So what? It never stopped Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> Why don't you come with me and see the Wizard of Oz? Come on, Scarecrow. What's that terrible noise? It sounds like a wild animal in the jungle. I bet that would scare your Mrs. Thatcher. Not after Eric Heffer at question time. <laughs> put him up, put him up. Scared of fighting, are you? Why, I could lick you with one paw tied behind my back. Put him up to here. Come on, put him up. <laughs> sure, I'll put him up. Like Mrs. Thatcher says, we must never be ashamed of frequent upper movements, especially in social spending on the health service and education. Oh, all them fancy words. <laughs> what the heck's she talking about? So help me, I'll, I'll pulverize the poor woman. You don't frighten me. <laughs> oh, oh, you, you didn't... Need a go and hit me, did you? Oh, that's my problem. I don't frighten anybody. I'm just a coward. I ain't got no noise. Oh, you could learn a lot from Mrs. Thatcher. She's got plenty of nerve. <laughs> wow, a man made out of tin. Oh, it's perfect, the tin man and the iron lady. <laughs> she wouldn't want to know me. I'm all hollow and I go clanking around making stupid blunders. Oh, that sounds just like her husband. Why, she <laughs> you. But two or three times a day, I get oiled. So does Dennis. <laughs> Why, banging on my chest. See? Hollow. I haven't got a heart. You don't need a heart. You can help Mrs. T to dismantle the welfare state. Why don't we all go to the Emerald City and see the wizard? And maybe I'll get to meet Mrs. Thatcher. Swell. We'll stick together. We'll form an alliance. An alliance? <laughs> oh, boy, you really need a brain. <laughs> We want to see the wizard. Nobody sees the Wizard of Oz! Not nobody, not know how! Well, he, he's great and he's, he's all-powerful and he's, he's very, very busy! What's he doing? Preparing an important speech! 
my fellow Americans as a, as another great communicator, one said, government of the people, for the people, and by the people shall not perish from, shall not perish from Nancy, where's the idiot board? <laughs> Forgive me, all-powerful wizard. There's a, a group of people, they insist on seeing you. Then show them in. <laughs> Come forward and be the great communicator. I am Oz, the all-powerful wizard. I can only see your face. Where's the rest of you? Oh, uh, uh, come forward, little girl, and tell me what you want. There's something weird going on. Why, you old faker? Why, you're not a wizard at all. You're just a closet president. I am the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Kindly state your... St state your, your... your business. Cut that out. I came here for some help. I have friends that are looking for a brain, a heart, and some nerve. Although now, mind you, that won't be necessary because they've decided to join Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet. And, and what exactly is it that you require? Oh, I want to meet my idol, the great Margaret Thatcher. Oh, that's no problem. I'll get Prime Minister Thatcher on my personal hotline. I think this one is... Oh, no, that's Casper Weinberger, George Bush, Frank Sinatra. Oh, oh yes, th th this is the one. Oh, I'm so careless. It, it, it's the wrong one. You mean we're not going to see Mrs. Thatcher? Uh, we're not going to see tomorrow. I've just pressed the, the red alert. <laughs> Good evening. I have recently been thinking back to the last great ball given by the Duke and Duchess of Bundling at their country house, Shingles. <laughs> it was in 1914, the lull before the storm. Dear old H.H. H. Asquith was at number 10, but I don't remember who else was in the charts. <laughs> the Bundling Ball was the highlight of the season. And the arrival of that crested invitation through one's door was a sure sign that one had a letterbox. <laughs> the ball was the climax of a long house party at Shingles. For three or four days before, the ladies would have been dressing while their menfolk were out in the heather banging away with their purges or down by the river trying to outdo each other with their flies. <laughs> but while they amused themselves, at the great house, all was preparation. My, oh my, the excitement below stairs, where the Duke had got Dawn, the housemaid, in the broom cupboard. <laughs> the Duchess, the ball would be an opportunity to show the family jewels. He was the chauffeur. Jewel. <laughs> Said to be very, very friendly with the Duchess. Yes, <laughs> I'm not one to spread scandal, but I know rumour had it. A rumor, incidentally, was the head gardener. <laughs> Soon, her preparations were complete, and the Duchess descended to greet her guests, and what guests they were. Most of the peerage was present. Burks, as far as the eye could see. <laughs> Cabinet ministers shared their thoughts with generals. <laughs> that didn't take long. <laughs> Bishops and actresses rubbed shoulders, amongst other things. <laughs> What a glittering assembly. Then the music began. The Duchess was a wonderful dancer. Really led the dancing, you know. Oh, yes, as soon as she was on the floor, everyone wanted to poke her. <laughs> dance followed dance. Waltz, cotillion, quadrille, minuet. Then came the gentleman's excuse me. Well, they'd been drinking all evening. <laughs> At last, it was over. 
The Duchess went up to her bedroom and laid out her jewels on the ottoman for the last time. <laughs> and in the conservatory, where he had nodded off, the Duke was aroused by the rosy fingers of dawn. <laughs> the last ball was finished. The sun was setting on the British Empire. And that was not the only thing the Duke reflected sadly that would never rise again. <laughs> You talk like Marlene Dietrich. Oh, was that your opinion, Dad? <laughs> and you dance like Zizi Jaume. <laughs> your clothes are all made by Balmain. <laughs> and there's diamonds and pearls in your hair. Yes, there are. <laughs> you live in a fancy apartment <laughs> of the Boulevard Saint Michel. <laughs> where you keep your Rolling Stones record And a friend of Sasha D. Stan Yes, you do But where do you go to, my lovely When you're alone in your bed Tell me the thoughts that surround you I want to look inside your head Yes, I do I've seen all your qualifications you got it from the Sorbonne And the painting you stole from Picasso Your loveliness goes on and on yes, yes. When you go on your summer vacation You go to Juin les Pins With your carefully designed topless suit You get and even suntan on your back and on your leg. <laughs> and the snowfalls you're found in St. Moritz with the other of the jet set. <laughs> and you sip your Napoleon brandy. <laughs> but you never get your lips wet. No, you don't. <laughs> but where do you go, to my lovely? When you're alone in your bed <laughs> Won't you tell me the thoughts that surround you? I want to look inside your head Yes, I do Your name, it is heard in high places You know the Aga Khan He sent you a racehorse for Christmas And you keep it just for fun For a laugh Ha, ha, ha. I know where you go to, my lovely When you're alone in your bed I know the thoughts that surround you Cause I can look inside your head At all the stops Santa stalks the suburbs. The bogus Father Christmas whose sleazy sleigh ride he didn't like them. Santa's victim talks to the Sunday stir. I got suspicious when he tried to fill my Christmas stocking before I'd even taken it off. <laughs> Sing along with the Sunday stir and enjoy a carol under the Christmas tree. Yes, enjoy a carol, a Susan and a Linda. <laughs> and for the man about the house, helpful hints on do it yourself. Meet the masochist who made a rod for his own back and find out how to make a torpor. <laughs> Exclusive to the Sunday Stir, Hitler's Secret Diaries. Read the Fuhrer's own words on how he played the worst game of golf in ten days in a bunker. <laughs> with a bang, get the Sunday Stir. This is the story of a great people who ruled an empire not always with wisdom and of how the terrible revenge their dusky subjects took was predicted by an obscure, sarried soothsayer. Do you really want me to say sarried soothsayer? <laughs> well, this is it, Laura. Delhi's big day. Plenty of sideshows, native wrestling, guess the weight of Lord Curzon, Bash a bearer. <laughs> Sounds rather amusing. Uh, does pig sticking appeal to you? No, I can't stick pigs. <laughs> uh, 
The damn program's full of misprints. Guests are respectfully reminded that dogs must be kept on a leash. Dogs spelled with a W. <laughs> The Indians show no sense of gratitude for what we British do for them. Oh, none whatsoever. Schools, hospitals, Christianity, flush toilets, all a waste of time. <laughs> and their religious beliefs are quite ludicrous. Yesterday, when I went shopping, a sacred cow was lying on the pavement. I just couldn't get into the shop. Well, sacred or not, you should have shoved her out of the way. Well, I didn't like to. She's playing bridge with us next week. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. You try a little punch? Good idea. I think this is you, dear. No, I'll bash him later. I say, dear, look over there. Some bint's telling fortunes. Should we have a crack at it? We shouldn't pander to their superstitions. Oh, don't be so po-faced, old girl. Might be amusing. Come on. Sit down and Jasmine Page will tell you all you want to know. Page? The name sounds English. I am Page the Oracle. <laughs> all right, you old What does the future hold? I see great changes coming to England long after you British have left India. After we've left? <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Sixty, seventy years from now, I see shops in England. Little corner shops. <laughs> they are a nation of shopkeepers. Not in the future. One day all corner shops will be owned by Indians. They are making big success, much money in <laughs> confectioners, news agents, greengrocers. Cobblers? Yes, many cobblers and all of them Hindu. <laughs> mending shoes on Sunday, bank holidays, and are open all hours. The woman is quite <laughs> Shall I bash her and shut her up? I see in England many, many Indian restaurants. Even small children will clamor for tandoori chicken and prawn balls. I didn't know that prawns had. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> English people are carrying home little metal boxes full of curry. They are calling it finger licking good. Oh no, no, sorry, wrong vision. No corner sun. Oh, they call it Indian takeaway. They ought to take her away in a strip. <laughs> You've had enough of your ravings. Come on, Laura, we're off. Heed my words. One day will come a man who will change the course of history. Lonely little man. He is stooped over. He is bald. Old before his time. He speaks much and weeps with great emotion for Indian people. You mean the Mahatma Gandhi? No, Richard Attenborough. <laughs> It is at this time of the year that one's thoughts inevitably turn to the members of one's family. And for me, this also includes those people that constitute the family of the Commonwealth. Hold it. Hold it, everybody. Ed, Nigel. Yes, Rog? Getting a bit of a flare off her forehead, love. Can you get it to tilt that bit of it? No, other way, love. Uh, tell her to face more to the right. No, 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 not like on the 50p coin. <laughs> That's it, fine. OK, let's go again. From the top, please, Your Majesty. Quiet, everybody, and... Q Queen. <laughs> it is at this time of the year that one's thoughts inevitably turn to the members of one's family. And for me, this also includes those people that constitute the family of the Commonwealth. Canada, Australia, Hong Kong. Hold it, hold it, everyone. No, sorry, Your Majesty, love. We, we daren't risk Hong Kong. I mean, we are giving it back, aren't we? And Canada's a bit iffy, isn't it? So, can we just uh, leave it at Commonwealth, love? OK. Uh, Nigel. Yes, Rog. Getting a terrible highlight off the brooch here. C can, can you do something about that? Sure, Rog. Okay. <laughs> How's that? <coughs> Fine. Right, let's pick up after Commonwealth. Part of the set. And Q Queen. This year, we have witnessed international celebrations that have commemorated the joyous occasion of VE Day. My memories of that happy time are still very livid. 
<laughs> Don't worry about it, love. You'd be amazed what rubbish people talk when they're nervous. Little fluffs in the class. What we in the media call outtakes. But it won't be seen. Well, that depends if we can flog it to Dennis Norton for it'll be all right on the night. <laughs> but you'll, you'll pick up from my memories of that happy time. Chick Queen. My memories of that happy time are still very vivid. And I was delighted to see that the spirit of unity had not diminished. Sorry, love. Gonna have to stop you. Is there a problem? <laughs> well, it's time to be slow, love. I mean, we only get eight minutes from now. I've got two minutes, 38 seconds of Britannia to get in. Could you pick up the pace a bit? I'll see what I can do. <laughs> if you... Uh, only we've got the sound of music at 3.10 and we don't want to lose the end of this, too. <laughs> OK. Let's crack on nice and lively. Stand by, Britannia footage. Stand by, everybody. Tapes running. In three, two, one. <laughs> on our travels to various parts of the world, we have been overwhelmed by the warmth and kindness of the many people we have met. Their generosity and goodwill being all the more significant when one considers... Stop, stop, stop. No, no, no. Oh. Good grief. Sorry, love. Not your fault. Uh, Nigel. Yes, George. We're picking up a funny sound down here. Is someone eating crisps or something? No, no, apparently they're changing the guard outside. Perhaps they can change them for something quieter. <laughs> Tell them they're going to have a cup of tea or something. Bung them a fiver. Well, I can't do that, Roger. It's traditional. Perhaps I could help. <laughs> Not now, love. Just concentrate on the order cue. <laughs> Nigel, she, she's moved ahead again. Oh, sorry, Roger. <laughs> okay, the noise has stopped. Now, don't worry your crown head about these problems, love. We can always cut the tape, right? The last time I cut a tape, I officially opened the M11 motorway. Please, Roger makes the funnies. There's only ten minutes before we're into double time. I've got Paul Daniels special at 5.30. Queenie, love, look, we've got enough to cut together. Can we just go to your clothes and spiel? Very well. Okay, everybody. Tape's running. And... <laughs> It is with this spirit of hope that we look forward to 1986 with renewed confidence. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a peaceful and Happy New Year. Great! Cut! That's a wrap, everybody. Thanks, love. <laughs> See you next year, OK? Oh, uh, uh, ju just one thing. Yeah? Uh, can we discuss my repeat fees? <laughs> Good morning, sir. Uh, can I help you? Well, I hope so. I've got these two monkeys in here, deceased, and I, I, I want to have them stuffed. No, oh, certainly. Do you want to have them mounted? No, just holding hands. <laughs> We are told the Christmas spirit is a With everything in Britain so absurdly overpriced, one can understand it going abroad. Have the old-fashioned values of Christmas vanished forever? Tonight on Probe, we try to find out. The spiritual aspect of Christmas is fast disappearing. Many Christmas cards nowadays carry coarse, rather distasteful jokes. I received this one today. A charming snow-covered landscape, but inside we find... A yule log is a cheerful sight, the little robins love it, to make the festive season bright. Just take the log and shove it. <laughs> and a signed blessing to you and yours from all of us at the vicarage. <laughs> the humour is offensive enough, but on the back I see the vicar has forgotten to erase the price, 85p. Christmas is obviously big business. One would hope that the true seasonal message could still be found in a simple nativity play performed by toddlers. However, recent press reports on activities at a junior school in North London have been deeply disturbing. I spoke to the teacher, Rita Kaplan, often referred to by the media as Red Rita. Miss Kaplan, you must be exhausted from producing the nativity play, not to mention the criticism it attracted. 
Oh, I feel completely spiced out. It blew my mind. <laughs> Many parents attacked it because it was so different to the New Testament version. I mean, St. Matthew makes no reference to rate capping or gay switchboard or green and con. <laughs> well, I wanted something the kids could relate to. You know, the environment they know. A sort of, you know, modern slant. And you felt Islington was a reasonable substitute for ancient Judea? Why not? Same terrible overcrowding, the same lack of hostels and day centres. And take Mary. She found she's gonna have a baby, right? They didn't have social security then, so she couldn't claim single parent benefit. <laughs> but you kept the Mary-Joseph relationship and the stable. Yeah, I'm in favour of stable relationship. <laughs> Why did you cut out the shepherds tending their flocks? I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> shepherds mean sheep and sheep mean lamb chops. <laughs> and the oxen in the stable? Well, we scrapped them for the same reason, didn't we? Instead, around the manger, we had nut cutlets, yogurts, and various health things. <laughs> but you retained the three wise men. Charmaine, please. Three wise persons. <laughs> Two ethnic minorities and a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> and did the three wise uh, persons uh, still bring gifts for the babe? Yeah, and that was a real problem. I mean, who in 1985 knows what frankincense and myrrh are supposed to be? My kids didn't have a clue. So I told them to go home, ask their folks, and bring in whatever they could lay their hands on. And what did they bring? Well, sort of, uh, you know, substances. <laughs> could you be more specific? Well, let's just say the street value was about 300 quid. <laughs> I know the biggest outcry was over your treatment of the star in the East. Yeah, we got a lot of stick over that, but I was very proud of it myself. I mean, thanks to the generosity of the GLC, we fired off a huge rocket. It shot up in the night sky and exploded with a shower of coloured stars. In letters 20 foot high, it spelled out the message of Christmas. Peace on Earth. No. Another 8,000 unemployed in this barrack. <laughs> During the countdown to Christmas, we are urged to spend, spend, spend. TV commercials are the most cynical and irresponsible of all, especially when they are directed at young children. It's the last word in toy technology. This high-performance spaceship will provide hours of Christmas fun for boys of all ages. Available from all good stores at only £99.95. And how's this? What's wrong, love? Wrong? It should never be allowed. The way they advertise stuff like that. Filling kids' heads with big ideas, building up their hopes that Father Christmas is going to bring them toys and stuff costing hundreds of pounds. Who can afford it? We can't. Oh, come on, Ada. Christmas is a time for the kids. We can't disappoint them. No, but a spaceship costing 99 quid. When I was a youngster, I didn't have expensive toys. I made me own amusement. Yeah, so did I till my dad told me to knock it off or I'd go blind. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a pencil and paper. What are you going to do, Fred? Make a shopping list. Now, you reckon that young Tommy would like one of them spaceships, eh? Oh, he'd love one, but... No buts. One spaceship, 99 pounds. Anything else? Oh, well, he's got his heart set on a model radar station. You can receive actual broadcasts from a space satellite. It costs about... Oh, four... 400? Near a five. Ooh. Right. Well, that's Tommy taken care of. What about her, Susie? Oh, well, you know how she's always playing doctors and nurses? <laughs> yeah. Well, she's very keen on something called the little patient. Oh, uh, what is it? Well, it's a sort of hospital dolly. It's got bandages, a saline drip and a pacemaker. <laughs> or you get a set of vital organs in plastic so you can do pretend transplants. Pricey. Mm, 180 quid. Oh, and she wants an ordinary doll as well. <laughs> so I'll get her one. <laughs> Oh, and Tommy wants one, too. Tommy. I don't reckon our Tommy's turning into... Oh, oh, no. He wants the large size in washable latex. <laughs> People who've had one say they'd never go back to hot water bottle. He's not getting one, and that's that. Otherwise, I can see no problems. Oh, Fred, you are a marvel. Yeah, I'll pick this lot up and give the kids a Christmas to remember. Oh. Are you going out straight away? Yeah, well, you know what they say, shop early for Christmas. Well, where'd you reckon? Well, I thought that big store, you know, top end of Oxford Street. 
what they call the fashionable end. But you haven't shaved or nothing. Aren't you going to change? Of course not. These are my working clothes. <laughs> Some of the blame may lie with the consumer. A shopkeeper may be genuinely trying to give value for money, while some of the customers can be very hard to please. There we are, Mari, and a very Merry Christmas to you. Oh, good morning, madam. But where's the regular man? Oh, he's uh, laid up with flu. I I'm Bert. Can I help you? Well, I certainly hope so. I want a Norfolk turkey. Oh, certainly, madam. <laughs> no, there. There's a beauty for you, eh? That's not a Norfolk turkey. That's a Worcester turkey. Will you please get me a Norfolk turkey? Sorry about that. Ah, here we are. There you go, madam. Young man, do you think I'm stupid? This is a Devonshire turkey. I want a Norfolk turkey. Will you please get me a Norfolk turkey? Norfolk turkey. Well, uh, how about him, then? Ah. Now that's a Norfolk turkey. Wrap it up. Certainly, madam. Hey, that would be ten pounds. Young man, I am Lady Barrington Barchester. I don't pay. I have an account here. Hey, very well, madam. There you go. Thank you. Tell me, how long have you been working here? Uh, two weeks. Where are you from? Well, you'd better tell me. <laughs> When it comes to giving presents, there's a lot of truth in the old cliché, it's the thought that counts. But what could the man have been thinking of who on Christmas morning gave his wife a tube of toothpaste, a toilet roll, a lavatory brush, and a sachet of foam bath? We felt there was no hope for such an insensitive husband who gave such indelicate gifts. However, a leading advertising agency thought otherwise, got to work on the product's image, and here's what they came up with. With deodorant and dentures And the castle gold Come and meet the beauties On the bathroom beauty show Every morning there's a rush As they squirt me on a brush Once my cap is off Men don't know when to stop <laughs> But remember Always squeeze me at the bottom Always squeeze me at the bottom Not the top Though I'm minty, fresh, and young, kindly keep a civil tongue. Simply open wide and my fluor will pop. If a boob screws up my tube, I hit rock bottom. So remember, squeeze the bottom, not the top. So remember, squeeze the bottom, not the top. <laughs> Call me a ripper, but once you've torn a stripper, you'll discover when all is done. I don't need to remind you that you've got me behind you. Miss Blue is still number one. Life gets controversial when I do my commercial. Being wrapped around the dark no fun. But when I'm in my own room, I'm queen of every throne room. Extra strength, double length, on the mound, in the jar, Miss Lugo is still number one. <laughs> Where the 
guns who break like rabbits But we've had to change our habits And we dare not stay Life is not so sweet now Under the sea today <laughs> Always acted rather blase Little cozy, little cozy Seems like home somehow Now we've got to rush off Or we'll get the brush off Laboratory brush off now <laughs> Inside a bowl or jerry is not salubrious, hot get lugubrious. A scrubber's life is tough, my friend. Every day on the job, I go round a bend. I thought that I'd be making merry when our pick came in view. We wash round a pan, but all was in vain. That son of a bleach went right down a drain. Ain't very sanitary But what can working girls do? We take the brush off! That's what working girls do to do be do Blue brush toothpaste got a fall You find your charm so pleasing But it cannot be denied That you've got to step aside For the pride of the festive season Farewell blues and so long troubles I'm Neptune's daughter, love sudsy water. Come and plunge your sponge into my beautiful foam. Under my bubbles, we'll play mixed doubles. You're a different person when immersing in foam. Foam can ease away a day. Tension. Foam can touch the spot I can't mention. Some smart jacuzzi could make us woozy. But we'll both relax and put our backs in a foam. Stanley Baxter is currently appearing in Aladdin at the King's Theatre, Edinburgh. 